The Lord is doing amazing things in the book of Acts, specifically in Jerusalem. And then we know that the Lord then brings persecution into the church. And the believers begin to scatter and they go in different directions. And then we watched and we charted here in Peter's life his interaction where the Bible gives us particular people along the way that Peter would have dealings with. We saw where he stood before a man who had been a high priest, a man who had been around for the ministry of John the Baptist, would have been around during the ministry of Jesus, and then even Peter would stand before him. And that man's name means the Lord is gracious. And we saw the graciousness of the Lord in that threefold witness that he would have had of John, Jesus, and then Peter. And then we saw as he stood before another who was on, sitting on the fence, that one guy who was the teacher uh, who, um, uh, to the apostle Paul, Gamil, and we see where Peter would even be in front of him, and he would have thoughts regarding that. And with all that Christ had done in Jerusalem and all that that man had been a party to, he still was on the fence about who Christ is. And there is no fence sitting when it comes to Jesus. You either believe or you don't. And we do, and we're glad this evening that we do. And then we watched as he went, and uh, we talked about the tale of two Simon, Simon the sorcerer, who desired the power of God. He was interested in that, and he thought he could buy position with God. We saw that Peter learned about that. Then we saw Peter dealing with Ananias and Sapphira, and they looked at their names and what their names represented that God has given, and then Sapphire, and how they had a wrong value system, and Peter learned that the Lord wanted to keep the church pure. Then we saw where Peter was with the outcast, a guy by the name of Simon the Tanner, and it was there while he was with the Simon the Tanner that the Lord sent somebody that we looked at last week to come to send some folks to come and bring Peter to them. And that was that fellow by the name of Cornelius. Are you with me now? Are you sure? Okay, because there will be a test. I'm going to want you to regurgitate all of that, all right? I have not these uh, 18 or however many Wednesday nights it's been on the topic of Peter reviewed for my own sake. I've done it for all of our sakes so that when we're done and we close the chapter on this and we move on to the next thing, you're going to be able to have that. You're going to remember that, right? Shake your head up and down there about Peter and all these folks that he met along the way. We saw where he visited a shut-in. Remember that fellow whose name means laudable, worthy of praise, that guy that had been sick for eight years. We saw where he was called to see Dorcas, whose name could also be, would be Tabitha, and how she had been a blessing to the people in the church, and they desired help for her, and she was brought back to life. Cornelius, in Acts chapter 10, remember verse 1, look at it with me, would you please? There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. And this was a Roman soldier, and he was a devout man, and this fellow had a vision and was told of what to do. At the same time that was going on, remember Peter had that vision. Do you remember that? Do you still have Thanksgiving brain? It's been a couple of Wednesday nights since we were in Bible study, and uh, boy, you had it on your brain Sunday, cranberry sauce and stuffing, and you were still eating leftovers, I think, that day. But uh, we're getting back to it now. And so you remember this vision that Peter saw as he was praying. Remember verse 10? And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Remember the Lord told him that? And what did Peter say? No. And the Lord put him through that process several times there to teach him a lesson, right? What was the lesson? He saw it. He figured it out later on. When Peter was going through all of that, Cornelius was sending those men over to come and to get Peter to come to them. They were Gentiles. There were people that Peter would not have been interested in being a friend with, first of all. And second of all, he would not have been interested in them knowing the gospel. But the Lord was wanting him to know that, Peter, I want you to take the gospel not just to Jewish folks, but I want the gospel to go to everyone. Because God is not, and we're thankful for this, God is not a respecter of persons, right? And we see that in the book of Romans. So regardless of what your heritage is getting there, whether it was the Jew or the Greek or even a group of people that uh, we'll see throughout the book of Acts called the Grecians who were Jewish people by blood but were Greeks by culture and behavior, regardless, because the Jewish folks, boy, they were, they were hard on those that were around them. They didn't like the Samaritans. They were real picky about all that because in the natural man, 
finds his standing in himself. You understand that? That's why the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should what? When salvation becomes about me, then that makes me superior when it becomes about my works. When salvation or position with God is about my birth or what people group that I'm a part of, then there's a superiority that is bred into that. And the Bible wants it to be very clear to all of us that God wants all men, all men, not just the Jew, but the Gentile, God wants all men to come to repentance. You know, there are people, groups that you and I, man, they, we have a lot of that going on in our country today. We have a lot of friction. And we have uh, politicians that divide us. And they use that as a way to control us and to get our eye off of what we need to be doing as a nation. But we get all wrapped up in that. And we need to break free of that as believers. We want people to be saved. We want people to be saved, sealed, led by the Spirit, walking in the light of the Word of God, so that they too can experience the fruit of the Lord working in them. And when we have that, regardless of who they are, we're rejoicing now. That's the, that's the answer. The answer is not in the educational system. The answer is found in the Word of God. It's found in bringing all people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and then submitting to His Lordship and following His Word. And what we ought to desire that for all people. And I rejoice in that when people, and man, what do you think heaven's going to be? Look at the book of, Acts, or book of Revelation sometimes. We're going to look out and there's going to be people from every kindred and every tongue and every nation all gathered together. And what are we going to be singing? Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise God. Yeah, well, all that stuff will be tore away and broken down then. But you see, Peter and his people, well, they had that, that a little bit, if you'll accept the, the, the expression, had a little bit of a chip on their shoulder about who they were. And there was reasons behind that. They were the people of God. They'd been given the law. They'd been, they'd been given that. They'd gone through a lot already. In their minds, you know, Peter's mind before Christ and, and living, they'd been an occupied people. They were a frustrated people. Many people followed Jesus in his ministry, not because they were interested in spiritual things. They were interested in the now. Restore Israel, restore the kingdom, be that king that leads us and leads us against this crowd. And many of them stopped following when they saw that that wasn't going to happen. They felt as if he'd failed. And so for Peter, there were still things that Peter needed to learn. So the Lord was teaching him. And it was important for Peter to learn that because he was, the Lord was setting him up because this Cornelius is going to call him and call him into his home, which would have gone against Peter's grain to help. Now let me ask you a question, and I'll move past this. Who is it that you don't want to help? Who is it that you don't have a heart for? What age group? Some of you older folks, you're much, much older than me. Some of we look at the young whippersnappers coming along, you know, and we say, ain't got a lick of sense. What a messed up bunch. Sometimes we get a little bit of an attitude towards them. They don't know how to work. They don't know how to do this. They don't this and that, you know. You got this problem going. I don't have enough sense. Well, if we're not careful, if we don't reach into this generation with the gospel, if we don't seek to win them to Christ and then seek to establish them in the Word of God and teach them to be led by the Spirit, what, what will become of us? And what group of people is it? What well, quiet, isn't it? The Lord wants people to be saved. Now our job is to win them, teach them, so that they can do the same. You want to make a profound impact you're not going to do it through social programs. You're going to do it through the spiritual program, and it's God's program. And that's the local New Testament church, and that's what we're called to do. And so I rejoice that you can look out on a Sunday or a Wednesday, and you can see people from all walks of life and all generations and people hearing the Word of God and being established in it. I'm thankful when there are people who are unruly and need to be taught how to behave. I'm thankful for youth 
that sometimes disrupt the service because they're not accustomed to being in church because they haven't had anybody to come and sit with them and show them how to behave in church. That's all right. You'll be all right. You're, not, you're only listening 50% of the time anyway. We're glad for that. We want to reach people, amen? And Peter needed to learn that, and God was teaching him that. So Cornelius would send for him, and we talked about all that. Then we come to Acts chapter 11. So remember now, when these folks got saved, and they were non-Jews, they were Gentile people. The Bible says in verse 44 of chapter 10, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter. Peter had people that came with him, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the what? The gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to, to, to tarry certain days. Now look. The Bible tells us this, and I don't have, I don't have, this is not the place for it tonight, the time for it, but the Bible teaches us that the Jewish people require a sign. And so these Gentile believers received the gift of the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues and magnify God, not so much for them as much as it was for the Jews who had come with Peter to be able to say, hey, they got the same thing that we got. They're, they are also those pro that promise that, that God had given to them through the prophets of what would happen when the Messiah had come, that working that would go on, that was unfolding in front of them. You see, the people of Israel, boy, would to God they'd have opened their eyes as a nation and their hearts would have been open at the time that this outpouring was taking place. But they didn't. They did not. But that evidence of the Holy Ghost there, and so now today there are groups of people who say, if you're not saved unless you have and you demonstrate the gift of the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues. Well, the, the, obviously there's several things that would be dangerous about that, but if somebody told you the only way to know for sure that you're saved is that you speak in tongues, guess what you would want to do? I'd be figuring out a way to speak in tongues, wouldn't you? And that's not what happened. Nobody was figuring anything out here. The Holy Ghost came upon them and they began to glorify God in tongues and Catch this, the Jewish believers that were with Peter, they understood what was going on. This wasn't a big gibber fest. And I'm sorry if that's your background, but that does not bear out in the Scripture. And I'd be glad sometime to sit with you and take you through that. The other thing about that is that also means that once the Jews who require a sign, once things shifted away from the Jew to the Gentile, then many of those signs that were manifest in Peter and others began to cease. Why? Because in God's economy, the sign was for the Jew, and when the gospel shifted to go to the Gentile, then those things came to an end. And if you don't believe that, then just accept this and don't get upset about it. And don't get, I had this conversation on vacation years ago with a gentleman. I started witnessing to him, and we got into this stuff about the book of Acts and the signs and whatnot. And I said, well, how, when was the last time God shook the ground somewhere where a church was meeting, there at a prayer meeting? Because let me tell you something, if that was going on, we'd all know about it. How about this? When was the last time God raised up the dead from an apostle, one of these modern-day self-proclaimed apostles? If Oral Roberts could heal people, why did he have a hospital? It's okay. It doesn't shake me. It doesn't, it doesn't disappoint me, right? You're not going to walk by and grab the hem of my garment and be healed and have your issue of blood that you've had for years instantly dried up and me turn around and say, hey, who touched me? I just healed somebody. But people were getting in the shadow of Peter. Peter walking by and they're getting healed. It doesn't rattle us. It doesn't affect our perspective. We understand what God was doing. God was showing himself to the Jewish people in such a way saying, hey, I'm here. I've been here. I've gone. This is what's going on. It's that time. And what do they do? They like that one guy that we talked about, Gamil. What was he saying? He's still on the fence. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see where this goes. And so here we see this. Now, this is important. Go to Acts chapter 11 with me if you're not too mad at me. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard 
that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. All right? So Cornelius asked them to come, and the people back home, they hear this, because you have to remember now, predominantly the church in Jerusalem is Jewish people that have gotten saved. Now that we'll see in Acts chapter 11 that there are people now that are beginning to go into various places and other group people groups are being preached to and are being saved, but that's predominantly it. Well, if I'm a Jewish person and a Jewish Messiah came, he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again, and now I'm experiencing all these signs, and I have that mindset, you know, that we're the people of God and this is the work of God that's going on. They're not so open to even knowing how other people other than Jewish folks could be saved. I, probably in some cases they didn't want him to get saved. Would you want a Roman soldier who was occupying you? Would you feel real good about him saying, I'm now also a part of the kingdom of your Messiah? There would be some things, there would be some natural friction there, there would be some problems with that. And so here in Acts chapter 11, verse 1, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea, so apostles is leadership, right? Who is that? That's James. That's the others that are in there. That's those apostles there. And brethren, that's the same folks there that were in Judea, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Now, how did they hear that? Peter and those Jewish men that had gone with him, they saw that these men heard the gospel, responded to the gospel, that the Holy Ghost manifested himself there, and that sign was there, and that news begins to travel back. Hey, they got what we got. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. That expression circumcision is a general title to given to the Jewish people, to the Jewish believers. They contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. That's an offense to go in and have dinner with them. You didn't keep their company. That's how strong that was. And these are people that he went in with. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, Slay and eat, but I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. In other words, what God has said you can eat, you eat. And what God was saying there about the man, mankind was this, If God says I want them to be saved, then they're in a position to be saved. You go to them. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. Verse 11, and behold, immediately there were three men already coming to the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. That's the six that were witnesses of what the Lord did. Verse 13, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house. This is Cornelius, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And we referenced that last week. That's why, in my opinion, Cornelius got saved when he heard Peter because he, need, he was a man looking for God. He was a man who was a, a, a person who believed in God, but he didn't know the way of salvation. And you know what? How could he without a preacher? There's a lot of people in the world who are they're looking to God. Not everybody's an ignoramus when it comes to figuring out that somebody created all that there is. You look up at the heavens and you figure that out. You look at the seasons, the order and the structure. And they need preachers. They need us to go in to take the gospel. And that's that great struggle because the devil likes to blind them and keep them blinded to these things. And so here we have him getting saved and those in his household. In verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Who was I to tell them, no, you can't be saved. 
No, you can't have this. You can't be a part of this. When they, that's the brethren, that's the apostles, those that were of the circumcision who were contending against this, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none only, but unto the Jews, but the word to none, but unto the Jews only. And then in verse 20, we'll see where some folks will go and begin preaching to the Grecians. And so here's the point. Peter at this particular time, here, let me drop back a slide. Peter and the Jewish believers, first of all, there's the accusation. They were upset with him, and he went in with the, to the circumcised. Now let me tell you something, and, and, and listen to this and hear this very carefully. Occasionally, the brethren don't understand what another brother is doing. Okay? They don't get it. There was a man who was a missionary to China. When he went to China to start out with, he started out in the coast. And he found that in the coast, and this was many years ago, he found that in the coast was where, generally speaking, where all the English-speaking missionaries had gone. And they set themselves up as kings, in a sense, and that they lived in nice buildings. They had nice places. They had a level of wealth there. They were near the port. And they were near the city. They were near all that was going on. And he was there for a few months, and he was stirred by that. And he thought, I've come here to China to reach people, and they're not really reaching these people. And so he did something. He went inland. And when he went inland, he began to wear his facial hair like the people of that culture, and he began to wear the garments of the people of that culture. His name's Hudson Taylor. He would eventually found something called Inland China Missions. Now, I assure you that in his day, there were brethren who did not agree with his methods. And I'm not going to debate methods with you this evening. But here's the point to be made in all this. We all have the same judge. And that's Jesus Christ. And at some point in ministries, we've all got to say, hey, I'm going to answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not an excuse to do it, something that's wrong. It's not an option to take bad, a bad direction. But the reality is, as I've said to people on occasion, I'll see you at the seat. I'll see you at the judgment seat. We'll both be shaken, I'm sure. But you're not my judge and I'm not yours. I'm his servant and I'm serving him. And so Peter had people who were against him. They didn't like what, what, how he went and where he was doing. They assumed things. But this is one thing to remember. After Peter presented his situation to them, they listened. They're, they were able to communicate that through. I'm afraid that there has been at times such unbelievable division amongst people who, generally speaking, desire the very same things. But because they want to do things a little bit different than somebody else, they make that person their enemy. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do everything with them. It doesn't necessarily mean you agree with everything they're doing. But like Jesus said, if they're, if they're preaching the gospel, if they're sharing my name, like Paul said, listen, whether it be by contention or for whatever purpose, if the name of Christ is being named, let's rejoice and then it's Jesus' name being proclaimed. Well, I don't like this about them. Hold on. Do they lift up the name of Jesus Christ? Do they make much of God's word? And so Peter explained, and people said, all right. And then he said, listen, I've got witnesses that were with me of God moving in their life. And what did they do? They glorified God. So be it. If, God, if this is what God would do, then, so, then let it be. So here's the principle, and I'm done. Peter learned a lesson. Hey, Peter was exactly where they were at before God called him to go, Right? The Lord taught Peter something, and Peter came back and he said, now let me teach you something. Let me teach you what the Lord has taught me. That's called growth. That's development. And as the Lord brings us along through his word, and he develops us, that's a good thing. It's a good thing, right? And aren't we thankful this evening that the gospel didn't just go to the Jew? First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Well, that's you and I. And I'm thankful this evening that Peter learned that lesson. I'm thankful that Peter did that, was willing to take that gospel in. And I'm thankful that those people heard that and received that and they went forward. You know, there, there's a lot of good stuff 
in the Word of God, when we just put a little thought into it and ask the Lord to teach us things and bring us along, and He will. And I see where He brought Peter and this crowd along. And then, I want you to notice this, verse 20, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So when the Lord taught Peter that lesson, and Peter took the gospel to the Gentile, and that word came back to the brethren, and they listened to that testimony, and they heard that the Lord wanted to save people other than the Jews, what did they then do? They began to branch out and preach the gospel to other folks. And people began to get saved, and there's no telling. You know, sometimes we read the book of Acts, and we see where the travels of Paul, and we think of those particular works that Paul went through. Those weren't the only churches that got started. There are churches that got started by disciples and by people who would hear and go that went all around the world that oftentimes in the Bible we don't see their story but we read about them in history and we find out about them. Yeah, that's a fascinating thing to me. There are going to be so many things that we're going to learn when we get to heaven about the impact of one person and how that was far reaching, that ripple effect. So until we get there, let's occupy and do what we're called to do. Let's be real careful that we try to size up the value or the importance of our life or our ministry or our testimony. Because I don't know that this side of heaven you really can. In eternity we'll know. That Sunday school class that you taught where that child heard the gospel, got saved, began to follow the Lord, and you lost touch with them, and you don't know what became of them. You don't know what life they impacted. You don't know all the ripple effect of that and who, how God would use that. Let's just be faithful and let's be soul winners. Amen? Let's get the gospel to everybody. Get you a pack of tracks tonight. Load up with the tracks. And as you're going out through life tomorrow and the day after, get a track passed out to somebody and tell them about Jesus. Want them to get saved. Pray for people to get saved. Let's be faithful to that. Tomorrow morning we'll go out at 10 o'clock if that works for you. It's getting awfully dark at night. And uh, we've been going on Thursday nights at 6 o'clock. And it is, it is pitch black by 6 o'clock on Thursday night. So if you would like to go tomorrow night, if that's something you'd like to learn to do, I think what we're going to start doing on Wednesday nights is we're going to talk about who wants to go on Thursday night and try to group up and know where we're going ahead of time uh, so we can get after it. But that'll help us to organize that. Come Saturdays, because of uh, me being in a position needed to drive a bus on Saturdays, it's created it where I'm not able to get to the church on Saturday mornings until 11. And so rather than having soul winning at 10 o'clock like we have for years, we're going to move it to 11 so that I'm able to be here to help with that and we're going to kick it off. And I'm going to challenge you when we get going in the new year. I understand you can't go every week perhaps, but I want to encourage you to go at least once a month. I want to encourage Sunday school teachers and workers, come out and go and get bit with this bug of winning people to Jesus Christ. We're seeing people saved every week. You don't see it like I do because you're not that, you don't get to see all the cards and the information coming in, but I believe this. I believe the Lord would lead you and use you to lead somebody to Jesus Christ, and I really believe that we can make a difference in our community for Christ, but it's going to take an effort from all of us. It's not just a few of us needs to be all of us, and we're going to help you with that, and we're going to restructure some things, try to have some training, and try to get you involved in that and engaged in that as we go forward in the new year. And I'm thankful for that good testimony of others and what they've done. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together. Can we please? It's been a good night. Thank you so much for being faithful. Appreciate that good time of prayer that we had this evening, gentlemen. Thank you for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now, and we'll be dismissed, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for the gospel and the good news. Thank you, Lord, for the people that you used in my life to bring the gospel, that preacher that came by and witnessed to my parents and then those Sunday school teachers and workers in my life that sowed the gospel seed. And then, Lord, thank you for uh, that wonderful, wonderful day when you saved my soul. Lord, help us to never, never, never get over that. Lord, help us each to be mindful of the others, of the others around us and their need for the gospel. Lord, help us to be faithful in that endeavor of bringing people to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you taught Peter and those in his day that you were wanting not just a Jew, but all men to know you and to come to you by sal uh, through salvation by grace. Help us now, Lord, as we go forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.